doppelganger apparently left the light on for COVID to come in, so we just hope he's feeling okay. And the question on the floor here today via author Angela Saini's The Patriarchs, The Origins of Inequity, in, uh, Inequality, is, is gender inequality natural to the human species? And it strikes me as curious or ironic that we're asking the question in a building where a prayer beginning with Our Father has been uttered countless times. <laughs> but as someone of the male persuasion, I'm gonna leave the stage as quickly as possible here. That's... But I would like to repeat that the Brattleboro Literary Festival is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, Brattleboro Community Television, which is live streaming this event today, the Stepansky Family Trust, the Thompson Trust, the Vermont Art Ca Arts Council, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Wyndham Foundation. We're grateful to all our advertisers in our program, and we encourage you to sponsor them. The festival's run entirely by volunteers. It's all free, but it's costly. So it is your donations that allow us to present it every year. We encourage you to contribute. You could use the QR code on these handy cards that have been around, or stuff something in those donation boxes you've been seeing at the various venues. And if you haven't already, please turn off the ringers on your phone, but feel free to take photos, put them all over social media. Carrie Baker is gonna act as moderator for this session. She's a contributing editor at Ms. Magazine. She has a monthly column in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Just told me she's recently gone into radio. She's the author of three books in her own right on the subjects of women's rights laws and policy, sexual harassment, sex trafficking, reproductive rights and justice. And she's a professor in the program for the study of women and gender at Smith College, where my mother went for two years until she transferred to Skidmore to be nearer to my father. Hmm. <laughs> Angela Saini comes to us via India, via London, via her current home in New York, and yesterday via Boston, where she leads classes in science writing at MIT, as well she should. She's an award-winning journalist and broadcaster, a writer of now four books, including Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong, and Superior, The Return of Race Science. Her academic honors are frankly too daunting to mention, uh, though I will mention she's the founder and chair of the Royal Institution's Challenging Pseudoscience Group, which takes on issues of bias and misinformation. In 2018, she was voted one of the most respected journalists in England, and in 2020, the British magazine Prospect called her one of the world's top 50 thinkers. And I think I'll leave it at that. Please welcome Carrie and Andrew. <laughs> So I just want to start by thanking the Brattleboro Literary Festival for having us and thanking, it's so, I'm so thrilled to be here on the stage with you, Angela. Yeah, so um, I want to thank you for writing this book, explaining the history of patriarchy, shining a light on the permutations and mechanisms of male dominance. And I want to start with a little bit of level setting. Um, can you define patriarchy? I teach at MIT, but I don't even know. Is that working now? That's good? Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I wish it was a history of the patriarchy. It's really a history of the origins of the patriarchy. So how did this, what in fact, if you look at the whole of human history, is a very warped, weird way of organizing ourselves. We as humans, um, you know, whatever else we are, and I always hesitate to talk about human nature, we hate to be treated unfairly. And you can see that so clearly, even in very young children, that you know, if you have two toddlers and you give one the sweets and you don't give the other one the sweets, instantly, immediately, they will feel this very deep sense of grievance and, and not, not just for the one uh, who has given the sweets, but even the one who has the sweets will feel bad for the one that doesn't. So that deep sense of unfairness, which I think really is a part of human nature, um, in some way suggests that um, any kind of 
inequality in society has to go against the grain to some degree. It must do, because we won't stand for it. We will always push against it. So how is it that we have created societies in which, for instance, if we are to look at some of the most patriarchal societies in the world, for a long time, including in the US, um, treated wives as the property of their husbands, did not allow women um, to keep their own earnings if they were working. Um, in some cases, for, for instance, in France, in, into the 1960s and 70s, a man could legally stop his wife from working um, because her labor was seen to belong to him. Um, in England, until well into the 19th century, uh, a woman's children weren't even her own. If she left her husband, they, those children automatically belonged to him. She had no rights to them. So how did we manage to build societies like this that denied women the vote, denied women the right to earn, denied women even their own identities? Um, and that, I think, is one of the weirdly overlooked questions sometimes in feminism, that we are very good at cataloging the terrible things that have been done to women, the horrible abuses under which women around the world still live, uh, but we very rarely ask why. How did it originally get to this? And that's what I wanted uh, to do with this book, is just go right back to the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean right back to the very, very beginning, the earliest, very earliest societies that we have evidence from. And when you do that, just to come back to your question, then this, this word patriarchy starts to look a lot less clear than it did before. It doesn't feel so monolithic and scary. It really feels like a grift, something that people have had to institute and work out for a very long time and something that we're still doing. So at least in this book, I explained that when I look around, I don't see one overarching patriarchy. I see many, many different patriarchies and they all depend on the time and the place that they're in, the cultures, and also they are still being reinvented and recreated right now. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So in your book, you do a lot of myth busting about patriarchy. You challenge the ideas that patriarchy is inevitable, that it's biological, that it's universal, that it's stable, singular, or normal. You describe patriarchy as plural, that there are actually multiple forms of patriarchy. A few years ago, um, Cynthia Enlow, who is an international relations scholar, published a book called The Big Push, Exposing and Challenging the Persistence of Patriarchy. And she argued in there that patriarchy is actually adaptable and flexible and constantly evolving to maintain power. She also argues that patriarchy is not natural or inevitable, but it's an intentional social process taking thought, actions, and alliance making to sustain. Is that what you found in your studies of, of the origins of patriarchy? Absolutely, and I think um, very often, and I didn't think this was still the case in the 21st century, but when I speak to people, uh, one of the common myths that we have is that patriarchy exists because men are on average a little bit stronger and bigger than women. You know, that is such a widespread view that because of this physical advantage that men have on average, that must explain the roots of all of this. It must have always been this way, at, you know, to some degree. Um, and that's not how power works. So even if we look, for instance, at our closest primate relatives, so, um, and scientists often do this, how do we understand our evolutionary origins? It's very difficult to go back and trace that, but we can look at other species that are very similar to us. And the two closest species to us genetically are chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees are male dominated. They are, you know, the males can be very vicious and violent towards other males in the hierarchy and to, towards other females. And for a long time, they were the um, prototypical model for how we must have been in the beginning that humans were something like chimpanzees a very long time ago before we were humans. And then in recent decades, it became very clear that the other species, just as close to us genetically, and some primatologists now argue possibly even closer, bonobos, who were assumed to also be male-dominated, actually have turned out to be matriarchal. That this is a f very clearly female-dominated species. And in fact, when I was writing one of my previous books, uh, Inferior, I went to San Diego Zoo 
with a bonobo researcher, a leading bonobo researcher. And just when I'd got there, um, a male had been injured in that enclosure by an older female. And in fact, so badly injured that he was kind of, he seemed to be cowering in the corner, almost hiding, scared that it might happen again. And the reason for this is that in the wild, and even in captivity, bonobo males usually get protection, access to food, and access to females through their mothers. And this male happened to have been nursery reared and then placed in this enclosure, and he didn't have any of that. So he was, he was immediately a kind of automatic victim of the eldest female who was at the top of the hierarchy in this community. Now, even among bonobos, the males are on average slightly bigger than the females, slightly stronger. The reason that bonobo females have the power and authority that they do is because they form such strong alliances with other females. These networks, even with females they aren't related to, which is quite unusual in the animal kingdom. Um, and in fact, arguably, humans, you know, we are quite unique in being a species that forms such strong alliances and networks very broadly outside our own family groups. So the key to power, as I try to explain here, is not just strength. And if it were, then surely our leader, you know, we don't elect weightlifters and <laughs> athletes. Um, if you look around the world, the world's leaders tend to be older and sometimes quite frail men. You know, it's not, it's not the strongest people. The, the source of their power is not their physical strength. It is their power in building alliances and networks. It's people. It is people that give us power. It is how much support we as individuals can draw on that gives us um, power. That's the root of all power. So just coming back to your question then, you know, it is one of the myths I try and bust is this idea that it's just all about biology. So um, Harvard Law School professor Diane Rosenfeld has a new book out called The Bonobo Sisterhood. And she's arguing that human females need to get a, a memo from the bonobos as far as standing up for each other, and particularly around male violence. And it's an entire book about that as a strategy to combat um, patriarchal male violence, which I think is so interesting. So I want to shift. Um, you, in your book, you, you just talked about matriarchy. And in your book, you, you actually contrast patriarchy and matrilineality. And I wanted to know, what is matrilineality, and how does it differ from matriarchy and patriarchy? Well, we will often um, try and frame this in binary ways. That If we didn't have patriarchy, then would the other possible way we could live in is uh, matriarchal. And if any, if we were just talking about the Barbie movie right now, that's really the dichotomy that you have in the Barbie movie, that you have Barbie land, which is clearly matriarchal, or you have the real world, which is clearly patriarchal. Um, and it doesn't occur to us that why would it necessarily have to be either of those things? We can live in so many different ways. And real life matrilineal societies are a good example of that. Um, so there's only one illustration in the book. I'll just very quickly uh, hold it up so you can I know it's a, we're at a distance, so it's difficult for you to see it, but um, it is a map of existing matrilineal societies in the world. And they're all um, over the world. They're all over the world. We have at least 160 that anthropologists have uh, documented. So these are existing ones. There would have been even more in the past, um, and they're everywhere, all over the Americas, an entire um, what's called a matrilineal belt across Africa and right throughout Asia. Um, none, uh, no existing ones in uh, Europe anymore. Mm. But what we see is every single one of them is different. And that is exactly what we should expect, that if you have societies that are spread out all over the world, why should they be similar to each other? There are millions of different ways that we can organize ourselves, and in each of these matrilineal societies, you see that diversity. There are some in which there are goddesses that are worshipped, there are some in which marriage as we understand it, doesn't really exist. There are many in which, so matrilineal essentially means that property and name is passed from mother to daughter rather than from father to son. Um, so there are many in which the eldest female is the main authority in the household. Um, there is just you know, this huge degree of social variation that exists. 
Now, anthropologists, Western anthropologists, have often framed this as uh, the matrilineal puzzle. How is it that these societies exist? Why have they not disappeared yet? But I think the bigger question we should be asking is not why they exist. It stands to reason that we, sh we should have social diversity. What is weird is why patriarchy has become so common and so homogeneous in very different parts of the world that it can look so similar you know, on different continents. Um, and for that, of course, you have to trace this long history. So is matrilineal, are matrilineal cultures, do they have violence? Do they have domination of males like patriarchal cultures have of females? Um, I don't want to fall into this essentialist trap of suggesting that women aren't capable of violence. They are also capable of violence, of course. Um, and you see that whole range of behavior there. But generally in these matrilineal societies, the reason that they aren't often described as matriarchal is, it, is because power and authority is shared between women and men. So for example, there may be, uh, you know, the eldest female will be one of the authorities in the household, but also her brother will also have a lot of power in that household. Um, so there is, a, there is to some degree a balance. And if there is power being exercised, it's often through seniority. So it's often through age that power is decided rather than through gender. You argue um, that the rise, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the rise of patriarchal societies coincided with the rise of nation states. And you connect patriarchy to colonialism and imperialism. Is, is that right? And, and if so, can you explain those connections? Yeah, so at this point, some of you may be wondering, if it's not to do with biology, then how did patriarchy first come about? Um, so one of the theories uh, was that it was agriculture. You know, so this is a very widespread thing that you will read in the literature, including feminist literature, that once you get agriculture, then you have property, and men, because they want to control property, then become very keen to make sure that um, their children are their own children, not somebody else's, so that's when they start to control female sexuality. And um, while that feels compelling, it doesn't tally up with the historical evidence that we have for the m large reason because we have agriculture for a really long time, thousands of years before we see any signs of gender depression. And also we see women playing a very big part in agriculture and they still do, you know, uh, small scale farms all over the world are still um, at least 50% of them managed by women. So it's, you know, on lots of different levels that theory doesn't hold up. So where can we see that big change? Now, one of the first places I visited um, when I was writing The Patriarchs was Chattel Huyuk. Like I said, if we want to understand the origins, we have to go right back to the beginning. And the earliest we can possibly go back, the first place that we have any data from, is uh, a settlement that was occupied around 7,400 BCE in southern Anatolia. So this is in modern-day Turkey, uh, near the border with Syria, where the recent earthquakes happened. You might remember there were those earthquakes in Turkey. Now this site, like I said, more than 9,000 years old, predates writing. It predates the very first pyramids in Egypt by thousands of years. It predates Stonehenge by thousands of years. And it's very complex. And this is what makes it a fascinating place to study, because it isn't just a hunter-gatherer site. This is a settlement in which thousands of people lived. We see these box-like homes without doors or windows, kind of openings in the ceiling and a ladder. So everybody would go out of their house and through the ladder in their, in their ceiling and then conduct their business on the top of their houses. And new generations would build their houses on top of old generations. So when I went to this site, it was like looking at a honeycomb, you know, like a, like a um, big hive that here are all these boxes jammed up against each other. These beautiful, vivid red frescoes of hunting scenes and vultures picking apart dead bodies on the wall, bull horns embedded in the walls, very elaborate um, burial practices, so many figurines that were buried here, a really complex society. And yet, every single measure we have using archaeological data of gender inequality, and there is a lot that we can gauge using human remains, 
tells us that men and women here in Chattel Huyuk lived pretty much the same lives. They ate the same kind of food, they did the same kind of work, they spent around the same amount of time indoors and outdoors. Um, they, even the difference in height between them was minimal, which is important to remember because we often assume sex difference to be a kind of hard and fast thing. But there are huge variations in sex differences in height in different countries, even now. But depending on how we treat people, you know, how we live, that can also affect biological differences as we perceive them. So every single measure tells us that there was no gendered hierarchy in Chattel Huyuk. At least this is what the lead archaeologist at the site told me. And women weren't invisible because we have so many female figurines from that era and from that entire region, the Fertile Crescent. Um, in fact, we have more female figurines than we do male figurines. If you go to the museums in Ankara and Anatolia, it's just all these rows and rows of different female figures of different shapes and sizes in different poses. The most famous from Chattel Huyuk is the seated woman of Chattel Huyuk, which I urge you when, you, when you get home, please look up on your phone and just have a, have a look at this picture. I saw her in person, and it is breathtaking, this figurine. She's about as tall as my hand. But this depicts um, what looks to be an older woman sitting bolt upright, so her back is completely straight, she has these deep indentations in her skin all over, and these beautiful rolls of fat spilling out all around her. Um, and like I said, completely bolt upright, looking straight ahead, and underneath her resting hands are what look to be two big cats, one on each side of her, looking straight ahead. We think they may have been leopards. She looks so authoritative. So when this was excavated in the 1960s, she was described immediately as a goddess, that here is some, you know, she must be, what else could this be? Now, more recently, archaeologists think she may have been a real person, possibly a matriarch in, that, uh, in her community, because she looks so naturalistic. We don't know. I mean, all of this is speculation. But what we can say, then, is in that region, 9,000 years ago, there are no signs of a gendered division between how men and women live, or a gender division of power. And we know, of course, that today there really is. Turkey is a very patriarchal place today. So when did things change? Now, in the evidence, as far as we can tell in that region, the turning point did not come with agriculture. It came with the emergence of the first big states. So if you imagine in that region, uh, the Fertile Crescent region, when ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Assyria, these early big civilizations are first emerging, what matters to the people at the peak of those societies the most? So this is men and women, the social elites who are trying to create these big states. The most important thing to them is population. How do we get people to stay here and live here and produce a surplus for us and defend us if we need to be defended? which they did because states didn't exist in the way they exist now. They had to be created and fought for and defended and built up. They didn't have automatic wealth. That had to be created over time. And because of that concern over population, and this is something that uh, the anthropologist James Scott has written about, you know, you look at cuneiform tablets from that time, they're lists and lists and lists of resources and people. They are so concerned with how much do we have of everything? What happens is that translates over time into a pressure on families to have as many children as possible and to be loyal to the state. That stands to reason. And that in turn creates a pressure on young women to have as many children as possible and young men, if they aren't having those children, to be available to fight and die for the state if necessary. So you can see quite clearly you know, between 5,000 and 7,000 years ago, this gender, these twin gendered concerns emerging with the rise of those early states. This idea of femininity being tied to motherhood uh, and masculinity being tied to fighting and defense and being stoic, you know, for the state. Whether you are suited to it or not, we know that not every woman wants to have kids or is able to have kids or is a good mother. The patriarchal state doesn't care. 
The patriarchal state just wants you to have as many kids as possible. And the same with defense. Not every man is suited to go and fight or wants to go and fight. But again, the patriarchal state doesn't care. So that is where we see you know, the very earliest shoots of how the state starts to control what happens in the family. We often assume that patriarchy begins in the family. The evidence actually suggests it went the other way, that it started with the state imposing its ideals on the family. So I, I think a lot of people sort of understand the harms of patriarchy for women, but I want to ask you about how does it harm men and boys? Well, in the ways I just said, it, it applies these gendered, very strict, narrow gendered norms, not just on women and what they can and can't do, but also on men, on how they should be, how they should be expected to behave. And we can see that even in modern day states. You know, that concern around birth rates is a universal one. As soon as birth rates start to fall, governments get very nervous because this is the linchpin of how states are organized. Um, if you look at modern day Russia, for instance, I think Russia is a perfect example because under Putin, it really has become the archetypal patriarchal state. Putin is the figurehead for misogynists all over the world now. They look to him. Um, and what's interesting is uh, following the Ukraine war, there has been a real uh, crisis in population levels, in availability for you know, the military of, of uh, people willing to go and fight, partly because there isn't fully buy-in towards that war, but also because, you know, for normal reasons, not everybody wants to be conscripted. So last year, the Russian government announced, and I just wrote a piece for the Financial Times about this recently, they announced that there would be, for any woman that gave birth to 10 children or more, a state honor called the Mother Heroine Medal. So if you have more than 10 kids, you are given this state honor. And if there is any more patriarchal act than that, I can't think of one. You know, it very clearly shows that your duty to the state is fulfilled by the number of children that you have as a woman. And on the other side, um, just this year, the government announced, because of course there's all these young Russian men who don't want to be conscripted, who really don't want to fight in this war and are trying to flee the country, the government uh, put out an advertising campaign that said that uh, you should be a man. That was the phrase being used, be a man, by enlisting, that this is how you fulfill your duty to the state. This is how you fulfill your role as a man in society by fighting and defending your country. So I think, you know, there, and you see echoes of this all over the place, I mean, all over the world. And arguably, even in the concern about abortion rights in this country, has its roots. The fact that the state even cares about abortion, I think, has its roots in this uh, concern about population. So if it harms women and men, who does it benefit? <laughs> it benefits those at the top. And like all forms of oppression, you know, whether we're talking about class or caste or race, the people who ultimately benefit are those at the top. Um, but of course, the insidious ways in which oppression works is to make us all feel invested in it somehow. That our loyalties, and this, this is what is so kind of um, powerful about patriarchy. This is one of the reasons it's, it persists. There's a, there was a wonderful book writ written a few years ago, Why Did Patriarchy Persist, by uh, I think it was Naomi Snyder and one other author, um, that looked at the psychological effects of patriarchal power, what it does to you. And if, so if you look right back to the origins of it, the state telling you that your job, your role as a human being is to either have as many children as possible or to be available to fight. What does that do to a family? It creates rifts immediately because it puts pressure uh, on parents to make sure that their daughters are being reared for motherhood. It puts pressure on mothers to tell their sons, you have to go out and fight now. You know, and even if you die, you are doing that job for the state. What a rupture an emotional rupture that immediately creates within the family. It creates tensions between um, partners, between husbands and wives. It undermines the possibility to live outside gender norms. That if you don't follow these rules around marriage and heterosexuality, that if you in any way transgress, you are already breaking the rules. And not only will the state be disappointed, but your own family will be disappointed because you're not 
fulfilling that duty. So the, you know, the message I have at the end of the book is not that we fix this problem through division, but it's the division that we need to reconcile, that we need to learn not to express our love and loyalty through you know, loyalty to the state, but through loyalty to each other as human beings. Uh, you know, learn to love each other again as parents and children, as husbands and wives, as partners for each other, to allow our children to be themselves without that pressure. That is the most difficult thing about pushing back against patriarchal power. Thank you, thank you. So a few years back, I wrote an article for Ms. Magazine called The Racist Roots of Rape Culture in which I delved into the deep interconnections between white supremacy and patriarchy. I wanna ask you, how is patriarchy related to white supremacy in the US and elsewhere? Um, well, as you mentioned earlier, um, a lot of my book is looking at the ways in which once patriarchal ideas are created, how are they propagated? How do they spread? You know, How do these systems look so di similar in different parts of the world? Um, and one of the vectors for that, of course, is empire and colonialism, and not just European empires, but predating that, Mongol empires, Greeks, Romans, you know, all of that, in different ways in different parts of the world, are exporting their ideas about male domination, how that looks, translating that into religious ideals, into cultural ideals, which then get adapted to local context. Now, just to take one example, in... Um, in the US. So like I said earlier, there are a number of matrilineal societies in North America. And one of the most famous, of course, is the Haudenosaunee, indigenous societies, uh, once known as the Iroquois, or sometimes known as the Iroquois. Uh, I moved to New York around two years ago, um, and I was still writing this book then, and it gave me the opportunity then to uh, do some research upstate. So if you go a few hours, drive a few hours upstate of New York City, you hit Seneca Falls. And Seneca Falls, you will know, is very famous for, in 1848, being the site of the world's, or of the country's first women's rights convention. And it's a testament to that. This, the town is kind of festooned with, you know, pictures of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and all these very big figures of um, American women's rights activism. This is the birthplace of women's rights, we are told, at least in, in the United States. Um, what isn't fully explained, or at least wasn't until relatively recently, there are some very hastily, you know, they've started to uh, change the story a little bit in the, villa, in the town, um, is that in 1590, so this is many years before the United States was even founded, Haudenosaunee women met in that same place to mm. demand peace among their nations. And the reason they were able to do that is because they already had a lot of power within their societies. Um, agriculture was uh, managed by women. The, they were matrilineal, so uh, inheritance was recognized through mothers rather than fathers. In fact, fathers were, in that sense, fairly peripheral to the family structure. It was, it was, everything was done through mothers, um, and still is. You know, uh, Haudenosaunee society is still matrilineal. Uh, clan mothers ran government at the local level and still do. So, you know, clan mothers predate the founding fathers. And that story isn't told fully when you go to Seneca Falls. The reason it matters to the story of American or the women's rights in the United States is because um, this didn't go unnoticed in the middle of the 19th century. Um, women's rights activists in Seneca Falls knew that these women had these rights, that they were living these, in these very egalitarian societies. Um, and in fact, even the American government has recognized that uh, democracy in this country took inspiration from the Iroquois. That's, you know, when Obama came into power, that was set into, um, that, that declaration was made. Um, but they didn't know how to, at that time in the 19th century, how to make sense of it. Because women's rights activists, American women's rights activists, were campaigning on the premise that here in the United States, they were creating the most modern and equal society on the planet. So how could they reconcile that with the fact that there was already a far more egalitarian society 
that had been egalitarian for a very long time already living among them. And the tragic way they did this was to say that the Haudenosaunee were primitive, that the way they lived was the way all humans had lived once, that we were all matriarchal once, and that sooner or later, when you get civilization, then men wised up and they took control of the family. And that's why modern civilized societies in their imagination were now patriarchal. And the devastating consequence of that was that they tried to civilize them into patriarchy. They took these young uh, indigenous children into uh, these boarding schools. They taught the, ch the girls how to be housewives, which they weren't before. Um, and they taught the boys how to do agricultural work. They wouldn't trade with the women anymore. They forced women in some indigenous societies to name their children after the fathers rather than the mothers. And you can see in the literature how much they fought back against this. You could see indigenous men and women all fighting back against what they were terming this horrible system that essentially put a value on the life of women that wasn't much more than a few acres of land. That they were treating women as property and are expecting them to do that when it was so antithetical to the way that they had always lived. But of course, you know, the force of the United States, the power, and not just, uh, you know, in physical terms, but also culturally and politically in so many different ways, grinding down Christian missionaries telling children, you are backwards, you are uncivilized, this is not the way to live. If you want to live in a civilized way, you have to live in a, in a nuclear family with you know, a husband and a wife, and these are the terms of engagement. That had its effect, and um, you know, the consequences of, of that are absolutely horrific, and you can see it uh, in modern day literature too. There is still so much anger and upset and resentment over what has been done, um, and real efforts to reclaim some of those traditions. But that story is not just confined to New York. That story is repeated all over the world, including in India. So in India, there were also matrilineal societies mm -hmm. that were denigrated, told they were backwards by British colonialists, and then changed the way they lived within a couple of generations. That is how social change works. It doesn't always happen like a thunderbolt happens bit by bit, it grinds people down, it changes how they think about themselves. Yeah, I teach a gender law and policy class at Smith, and one of the myths I try to bust early on is this progression narrative, that in the old days women didn't have rights and it's been progressively better. And this is easier now, post Dobbs, the uh, overturn of Roe, but all the way back to the beginning, I begin with the Iroquois, and I contrast the legal status of Iroquois to the colonial white women and explain how the Iroquois were an inspiration to the first feminists to organize. And um, they had a living example right next door of women who had more rights, and that gave them a sense of, yeah, this isn't inevitable. It's not ordained by God. It's not natural. And, and I think very much inspired them. Patriarchal societies such as the United States and patriarchal institutions such as the Catholic Church um, maintain high rates of sexual assault. I wanna ask um, why do patriarchal systems tolerate and sometimes even encourage sexual assault? Kind of like, and, and why is like religions, patriarchal religions so obsessed with sex? Well, we have to remember, if we go all the way back, so I'm often asked this religion question because I think a lot of people imagine that patriarchy began with religion. Um, partly because sometimes when you read religious texts, they seem to, you know, in some passages, mandate misogyny. <laughs> you know, there are some really terrible things in the Bible and in, and in other religious texts. Um, but that's not how it was at the beginning, of course. So l let's just take Christianity as an example. Here we have... Um, you know, in, in Roman times, in antiquity, uh, Christianity didn't look the way it did now. At that time, it was one religious cult among many. And um, it preached something that people genuinely hadn't heard before. In a society that was slave-owning, in which there was a high proportion of slaves, um, you know, there was a distinction between being free and being a slave. 
uh, in which there were very strict social hierarchies, in which there were very strict ideas about gender and, you know, what was appropriate. Here very was patriarchal. A, and patriarchal. And here was a faith that was telling people, or a religious cult that was telling people, um, we are all equal. That is why people flock to it, because they really felt that this was something fresh. This is why women went to it. This is why people of lower socioeconomic groups went to it, because they felt they were getting something that they weren't hearing uh, in other walks of life. But what you get over time, of course, and this, in some ways this is inevitable, that the establishment of religion, so the power around it, the power networks around it, become invested in the same aims as the state in that is that it's in. So um, you know, just like religious leaders need the state for legitimacy and to have license to operate, the state also needs religion to give it power and force in ways that it wouldn't have otherwise. You know, there's nothing quite as powerful as religious belief. It trumps everything else. If you believe in something, no, it's very difficult for anyone to argue with you about it. So they both gain legitimacy from each other. And so what you see over time is that the establishments of religion, their interests become intertwined with those fundamental patriarchal aims of the state. This is why today, for example, the Catholic Church is so obsessed with sex and family. There are so many other things that it could be interested in, in terms of inequality or you know, how we live. Why is the Pope so obsessed with family and um, how much sex we're having and who we're having sex with? You know, just recently I was reading that the Pope was complaining that in Italy people were keeping dogs instead of having kids. And he said, have fewer dogs and have more children. Um, why does he care? And of course the reason he cares is because the patriarchal state has always cared about population, about reproduction. Are you having enough children? Are those children loyal to the state? Um, so, you know, that is one of the ways, I think, in which the, you know, if religion looks so patriarchal now, it is because it has needed to do that in order to maintain its legitimacy over time. Thank you. Thank you. So, you argue that an important way that patriarchies achieve and maintain power is by controlling women's reproductive capacities. The U.S. has a long history of trying to control women's reproduction in the service of white supremacy by pressuring white women to have more babies and attempting to limit reproduction of women of color through things like forced sterilization. For example, in the 19th century, Congress and state legislatures banned contraception and abortion in part because there were high levels of immigrants at the time from southern Europe and um, Ireland and other places who had really high birth rates, whereas the white native Protestants had really low birth rates. And they were concerned about that, that it would threaten their own political power. Today, fears about the Great Replacement are fueling abortion bans across the South and the Midwest in the United States. And um, this idea that white people will be replaced by people of color um, is, I think, fueling the MAGA Republicans. And my question to you is, did you see a connection in your research between patriarchal reproductive coercion and racial supremacy movements in the US or elsewhere in the world? You see echoes of this everywhere. So my previous book was on race science, looking at the ways in which, I mean, what you're essentially describing is eugenic ideas about who should be able to have children and who shouldn't. How do we control reproduction in a way that improves, so-called improves, uh, the fitness of the, of the population? And that is a very long-standing idea that was enthusiastically taken up in the United States. Um, so like I said, I teach in New England, but across New England, um, there were huge efforts. There were sterilizations that were performed on many women, disproportionately women of color and immigrant women. Um, but there was also an ideological commitment to eugenics that sometimes I think we overlook because we associate eugenics now very firmly with the Nazis in Germany. But Hitler very much took inspiration from what was happening in the United States at that time. As uncomfortable it, as it is for us to confront that, that is very clear in his own writing, um, that you know, there were figures like Madison Grant who were 
huge enthusiastic supporters and funders of eugenic programs. The Eugenic Society was incredibly powerful and influential among American policymakers, all predicated on this idea that there were fundamental types of people. That there were some people who would produce a better class of citizen and other people who wouldn't and that we had to encourage a certain type of citizen. And that underpinned things like um, the anti-immigration bills against people from China or you know, from the Far East. Um, so much of you know, sterilization policies, like I said, but I think still lives on, even in the modern day, around the kind of immigrants that are sometimes still framed by lawmakers as the kind of immigrants we want and the kind of immigrants we don't want. You know, when Trump talked about shithole countries, you know, and sorry to use bad language, but, you know, people from countries who, just by dint of being from those places, are not going to be good citizens somehow. Um, and then other countries, like Nordic countries, are the good ones that we really, you know, will make good citizens. That is a deeply eugenic idea. It implies that fundamentally, there are certain people who will never be able to be the kind of Americans that America wants. And that does play out. These systems all overlap with each other. You know, patriarchy, and I often say, you know, gender depression is not something that you fix and then you work on all the other problems. This all overlaps, it borrows from each other. Marriage, you know, the way that modern states have organized marriage and gender equality borrowed very heavily from systems of slavery and captive taking and the way that people, you know, how we learned to dehumanize each other through those systems already, the way we treated outsiders already, foreigners and, you know, new people in societies. So all of this is interconnected. We have to solve it all at once or we're not really solving it at all. And that means looking not just at gender but at race, at class, at caste, at everything. Well, that gets to my next question, which um, in her book, Feminism for Everybody, Bell Hooks famously talks about white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. It's a mouthful. And discusses the intersections among patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. And you talk about money, and you talk about power, and you mentioned earlier that who patriarchy really benefits is this elite plut plutocratic class of sort of you know, like in Russia, the oligarchs. Here in the United States, the 1%. Um, how do these systems relate? How, what's the relation of patriarchy to capitalism? And are, like, less capitalist systems less patriarchal, like socialist systems? Well, that was the dream of um, the socialist revolutionaries in Russia. Um, and again, just coming back to abortion, we, sometimes, we don't ever mention this, but the very first modern state to legalize abortion was the Soviet Union. That was in 1920. And the reason they did that was because um, Lenin, very much in those early years, as much, you know, and I'm not in any way, just to you know, safeguard here, I'm not in any way whitewashing communism or the brutalities of the Soviet Union, especially under Stalin. But in those early years, the Russian Revolution was committed to you know, resolving or eliminating class inequality with an understanding, too, that that would bring about women's liberation. So very quickly, they not only legalized abortion in the name of women's liberation, but also opened up educational opportunities to everyone, irrespective of their background, including women. Which is why, to this day, and this is a big thing for me because I come from a science background and I'm a science writer, we often complain about the rates of women in science, engineering, and maths in the West. In Eastern and Central Europe and in Russia, you have very high rates of women in science and engineering because there have been many generations of women who went to technical colleges because of the Soviet Union. Um, so that was one of the things. You know, everyone was expected to work, whether they wanted to or not. And everyone felt poor as a result because there was this huge leveling out immediately. And again, not everyone was happy with that. Not, not everyone wanted to live in that kind of society. But there was, you know, this was all linked to capitalism. There was this idea that we solve class and we solve everything by evening uh, all this out. Um, and that created real panic in the United States. So we have this wonderful um, 
source of information known as the Harvard Project today, which is transcriptions of interviews that were done with people fleeing the Soviet Union in Russia to the United States. Harvard researchers in the 1950s interviewed these people and asked them what their lives were like because there was so little Im information about what life was like um, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And again and again in these transcripts, these are people leaving, so they're not happy, clearly. Yet, again and again, they say, yes, women had equality. Yes, women could divorce quite easily. Yeah, women were smoking in the streets with men. Um, you know, I was a woman economist, I was a woman pharmacist, it was absolutely fine, there were women professors, we didn't think that was very strange. You know, whatever else they were unhappy with or disappointed with, they really did have a measure of gender equality that women in the U United States in the 1950s really didn't have. But what's interesting here is not those end of the transcripts, it's the questions that the Harvard researchers are asking. They are so prurient and so fascinated and underneath it, you can sense this anxiety that, wait a second, what if American women might prefer this? What if they might want socialism instead of what we're offering them, which is domesticity, essentially, in the 1950s? That was a big thing. You might remember the kitchen debates between Nixon and Khrushchev, in which you know Nixon is proudly showing off this front-loading washing machine, state of the art, and Khrushchev says, you know, and, and telling Khrushchev, you know, look what we give our housewives in America, and Khrushchev telling Nixon, well, in our country, we don't treat women as slaves who have to work in their home. <laughs> you know? And there is that real tension that plays out in the 1950s between, you know, these heads of these countries, all men, I have to say, because even in the Soviet Union, the people in charge were still men right until the end, but both trying to figure out what do women want. What kind of life do they really want to live? And never quite resolving that. Um, but we have borrowed a lot from those socialist states, even though, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fact that in most of Europe now we have some form of soft socialism. You know, universal health care in many countries, education, until very recently, free higher education, when I went to university. Um, you know, many aspects, a very solid welfare net, safety net. And sometimes I do wonder if in the United States, part of the resistance to women's rights sometimes is rooted in that fear that if we give anything away to women's rights activists, we are conceding something to socialism, that we are, you know, that we are losing that ideological debate that we once had with the Soviet Union. Well, Nixon vetoed the child care bill in 1970 because he said it was socialist. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis Schlafly, who of course um, lobbied against women's rights, was always arguing that you know, she's very anti-communist and very anti-socialist. And even today, uh, and the MAGA Republicans, you know, anything that they disagree with, they call socialist, yeah. um, including any kind of women's rights. Um, so I. Be thinking of your questions, because I'm, I'm going to ask um, uh, two more quick questions, and then I want to take questions from the audience. Um, I think the U.S. is a patriarchy, and I think we can just look at the numbers. If we look at, you know, the percentage of men in Congress, it's like 70 percent. Percentage of men in state legislatures, mostly it's like 70 percent. Um, the number of CEOs of the Fortune 500 who are named John is more than the number of female CEOs in the Fortune 500. Um, if you think about that elite class that benefits most from patriarchy, um, it is those that narrow, often white um, group of men and their families to some degree, but under their thumb. Um, and, and I think that um, I want to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment because Ms. Magazine is owned by Feminist Majority, which is one of the organizations that's really pushing for the Equal Rights Amendment. In the last year of the Trump administration, the Equal Rights Amendment finally achieved full ratification, 38 states. But Donald Trump, Bill Barr, Mitch McConnell, the patriarchs, blocked recognition of the ERA would not let it be recognized as the 28th Amendment of the Constitution. 
most nations today have a sex equality guarantee in the national constitution. The US is really an outlier in the world. And um, is this important to have a sex equality guarantee in the constitution? I do think legislative equality really does matter. Um, and I don't think, you know, part of what happens when you take the very long view of history, which of course I've done, I go back 9,000 years, is that um, you start to see actually how many gains we have really made in the last couple of hundred years. It's very easy right now to feel despondent, but when you think that it wasn't that long ago that a woman, once she got married, was essentially the property of her husband, and that really isn't the case now how much progress we really have made because of legislative change. And it happens slowly. It happens through reform because, you know, that carries people along. It takes a long time. And it's so painful to have to wait for that. Um, but that is how lasting change happens, that once something is there written down and it's part of how a state works, that, like I said, this all comes from top down. This dictates how we behave towards each other, how we relate to each other. Um, that has a huge impact on how people then um, imagine themselves. So to take an example of a state that is going in completely the other direction. So like I said, in India, um, in Kerala, which is a South Indian state, this used to be a matrilineal region of India. Um, and it wasn't, um, you know, sometimes we associate matriline matrilineality with tribal societies, but this was a very wealthy royal family that was organized matrilineally in which the women were always very well educated, so influential that even other societies borrowed those systems, which means that Kerala to this day has very high rates of female literacy, much higher than India uh, as a whole, higher rates of literacy and education. It's much easier to travel there as a woman and work there. Um, and, but it was in 1976 that the Kerala legislature abolished matriline because of everything that had happened under the British, you know, this gradual degrading of, uh, of their beliefs and this conviction that matriline was backwards. Today, in the 21st century, Kerala is moving the, in the other direction because now equality is something to aspire to. You know, now the belief is the other way, that to be modern, you need to be gender equal. So um, in some schools in that state recently introduced uh, gender neutral uniforms for boys and girls. So essentially culottes, you know, short culottes and, and tops for boys and girls. And everyone was quite happy and accepting of this. Um, you know, there were no concerns about it. Um, personally, you know, that makes perfect sense. You know, there's not m many gender differences between kids until they hit puberty anyway, so who really cares? But um, the, what's interesting is the way that the Carolyn state framed this they framed this as a return to their traditions, you know, that we are going back to who we really are. And what's interesting about that is it reminds us that traditions are something that we create and reimagine with every generation. They're not something that really actually ever existed at a point. They're something that we have to make and maintain or reimagine or recreate and then pretend that they have always been our traditions. Um, and we can do that in the United States. Often, the way that regressive you know, moves towards patriarchy are framed, for example, in Afghanistan or what's happened recently in Iran, but also around abortion rights in this country, is that this is a return to something, a return to patriarchy. Yeah, MAGA, not, MAGA's that. Yeah, make America great again. You know, this, is a, this is something we used to have and now we're going to have again. It's not. This is just recreating, reinventing patriarchal ideologies for the 21st century in nice new clothes and pretending it's something old or you know, something that it used to be. We, as humans, have never had one original way of living. We haven't. And we know that. You, you can look at history and know that that's the case. So don't ever buy this idea that there is one natural way to be or that the Constitution is somehow sacrosanct and can't be tinkered with or amended. Because if there is one thing we've always done as humans, it's change how we live. Thank you, thank you. So I, I have one more question, and then it's gonna be you, so be thinking of your questions. 
So Cynthia Enlow, who I mentioned earlier, argues that, and I quote, patriarchy made transparent is patriarchy made vulnerable. Your book exposes patriarchies, which I think is a first step. But having done all this research and written this book and traveled all around the world talking about it, what can we do to end patriarchies? Oh God, I wish I, I'm probably underqualified to answer that question. Um, I mean, for me, it starts with uh, interrogating our own lives, our own family situations. I was very lucky to have grown up in um, a very egalitarian family. My parents split everything down the middle. There was no sense of men's work or women's work in our household. Um, and it's still that way. You know, after my parents retired, my mum took up another career in social work. And my dad does everything at home. And it's really not... Nobody thinks that's remarkable at home. It's just normal. It was a big shock to me to grow up and realize that other families didn't live like that. <laughs> it was a real shock to go to other people's homes and see the dad sitting there reading his newspaper while the mum was in the kitchen cooking. I just thought, that is so weird. <laughs> I've never seen my dad so much as ask my mum for a cup of tea. He wouldn't ever do that. You know, he would just go and make it himself. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is about how we ourselves organize our own family lives. And I've done the same, you know, we've done the same in my household, my husband's sitting at the back there. Um, but we have organized our family in such a way that we have an equitable division of childcare and labor. If anything, I have to give Michael credit here, he does probably more of the childcare than I do. Um, you know, we have organized things in that kind of way. That is within all our power to do that, to renegotiate those terms within our own families. And people have always done that. that. You know, you have, I've seen for myself, Assyrian cuneiform tablets in which a husband and wife are agreeing for equal rights to divorce. You know, in ancient Mesopotamia, <laughs> you know, if they could do it then, we can definitely do that now. So I think it begins there, but it's also, you know, these, these are also structural issues. And again, I'm not qualified. <laughs> to talk about those biggest struggles. Interestingly, Cynthia Enlow agrees with you. She talks about how we need to observe what's around us and how we interact. And, and she definitely thinks structurally as well. I, th I think it needs to happen at both levels, but I, I think that's interesting that you said that. So I'm going to hop down now and um, would love to take a few questions from the audience. I can keep asking questions. I've held out on my Barbie question, so watch out. If you don't have a question, I'm going to ask the Barbie question. <laughs> you, okay, you ask my Barbie question. So uh, what did you think about, oh, okay, I'll, I'll save my Barbie question. Uh, but I, I want a question from a woman, please. in Palestine, in Israel. <clears throat> you know, I think it can be argued pretty convincingly that both Islam and Judaism are both highly patriarchal mm -hmm. systems um, in varying degrees. And the whole history of the Middle East, in many ways, has been a history of these two religions circling each other, murdering each other, creating genocides around each other. And right now, probably as we're speaking, another genocide or two genocides will be happening because that's basically what's going to happen, I think. Um, and the whole role that the United States is playing in this um, and has really played in the Mideast, certainly since the the beginning of Israel in 1948 and before that. I mean, it's very... Can you ask your question? Just that is the question. That is the question. I mean, uh, how does one deal with a situation that is so deep and so historically long? Yeah, and that, I think it's by looking at these things historically. So the final chapter in the Patriarchs, which we didn't get to, uh, looks at the 1979 revolution in Iran. And Iran is important to what's happening in Israel and Palestine right now, quite crucially important. We forget that that revolution um, involved everybody. 
it wasn't just led by the conservative clerics. It was everyone was out on the streets. Socialists, women, <coughs> girls left their homes and lived in communes with people. They were all out on the streets en masse. Um, and all to overthrow what they saw as a patriarch of their society, the Shah of Iran, who was seen as betraying the country by framing um, modernization as having a closer relationship with the West, that it is important for us to you know, be as close to the West as possible. And his people, the Iranian people, saw this as selling out, essentially, that they were giving, you know, he was giving away the country to foreign powers, that Iran wasn't authentically Iranian anymore. And um, you know, that he, as the monarch, was this overarching figure who, even if he gave women some rights, and he did, you know, he did in introduce very late vote for women. He introduced women into government in very small numbers in the 1970s. Um, but it was always at his mercy. It was never you know, a democratic thing. So they all came out. The problem was that the Shah quashed all forms of opposition to him when he was in power, which meant that the only possible uh, people available to fill the void after he was gone were the religious clerics. You know, he couldn't get rid of the religious clerics. He could get rid of everybody else. Um, and that meant very quickly one patriarch was just replaced with another, that Khomeini came in and he replaced the Shah. And it was even worse than it was before, that he, you know, they, the conservative regime introduced all these new rules and created their own new patriarchy for the 20th century. Why this matters to this bigger story is because when we talk about you know, the age of these things, how long they've been going on, there is negotiation and struggle even within those stories forever, <laughs> even within Islam. Like I said, the early days of Christianity were very utopian and egalitarian. And the same with Islam. In its early days, Islam was seen as a hugely egalitarian force. This is, again, why people flocked to it. And there was a lot of um, difference in how religious ideals were interpreted within Islam. That, you know, um, uh, Muslim women often looked to the Prophet's daughter as a kind of symbol of how to be a good Muslim woman. But there were other Muslim women in his orbit who they could also look to. And in fact, it was a sociologist, Moroccan sociologist, Fatima Renisi, who, uh, while she was alive, documented, she became a theologian while she was fighting for women's rights in order to reinterpret her religion in such a way to make it compatible with women's rights. So I don't think, you know, just because we see religion as a kind of impasse right now. It doesn't necessarily have to be that impasse forever. I'm saying that as someone who's not religious. I'm not religious at all. And you know, my hope would always be to live in a secular society in which there is a separation of religion and the state. Mm -hmm. But that's not the world we live in. In the world we live in, religion really matters to people. It defines a lot of how we see the world and what we're willing to tolerate in terms of social change, including in this country. You know, if you look at abortion, anti-abortion protests, there are a lot of young women there, you know, calling themselves the post-Roe generation, who see this as a moral crusade. And we have to understand their point of view as well. We can't just assume that they're brainwashed and they just don't know what they're doing. They have their own moral framework around this. And if we are to see change within religion, there have always been feminist movements within religious communities. In this, you know, women rewrote the Bible in this country. They wrote the women's Bible in the 19th century uh, because they could see that they were never going to be able to make the case for women's equality in the United States in such a religious country unless they were to do that. So my hope, you know, what I would plead is for feminists in the West, if you want to show solidarity for women under patriarchal regimes, look for the feminists who are already doing that within those patriarchal regimes. The women who have the theological knowledge, who understand how to change the terms of how those state works. States work in such a way that doesn't have to erase everything completely, but can create change in a way that carries everybody along, that, that they don't feel left out by it, that they feel that it's compatible with their faith. 
Um, it is possible to do that. Like I said, it's not ideal, and I wouldn't, you know, in my dream state, I wouldn't organise it this way. But if we're to be practical, then I think we have to look to those Islamic feminists, Jewish feminists, who are already doing that really hard work. Okay, one more question. Could you use it so you can go back? Okay, I'm pretty well. All right, thank you. Um, very informative. So this is uh, comes out of uh, a curiosity of um, through my own life. So I graduated from Smith College, and I graduated in the late 70s, 80s, but I was an Ada Comstock, and I was very, I'm a very old, young Ada. Um, and going there um, during this time period was when a lot of uh, gal schools were going dual with bringing men, but um, there was the big decision at Smith to, um, to stay with just women. Um, because it thought it would give them strength um, and a voice uh, with the whole patriarchal thing. So, 43 years later, I'm wondering, um, has that been studied um, amongst Smith women or other all-girls um, schools? Um, did, is, um, is there a difference in how they see themselves without having male, um, um, you know, um, other students, it would, of course, not teachers, but. I guess this is a question for me, although you could speak to single sex education, but I will say um, young women come to Smith because it's all women, mm -hmm. or it's a historically women's college. And it's hugely important today, still. We have the only engineering program at a women's college in the country. And women are still way underrepresented in engineering programs. It's a, it can be a very hostile environment in a co-ed context. And we graduate tons of these young women that are, you know, incredible. Um, there's not a conversation about going co-ed. We don't need to go co-ed. There's a need for what we do still today. And we've got gobs of students applying. Our, our, you know, we have more than enough students to apply. Um, and so, that's not a question we're encountering. I think that schools that are maybe more economically marginal or have less students wanting to come to them might be thinking about that. Although it's really a niche that's very popular right now among young women. So I don't think that's re really the questions we're asking right now. Yeah. So I, I know we're just about out of time, but um, I want to thank Angela so much for um, coming today and for speaking about this important topic. And I want to gift her with a book of my own, which is Ms. Magazine Just Turned 50. Yeah. And we just published this book, 50 Years of Ms., the best of the pathfinding magazine that ignited a revolution. And New York Times described this as an illustrated guide to toppling the patriarchy. <laughs> so I thought, what a great gift for this wonderful speaker today. Thank you for being here. I mean, I've, I've always been a devotee of Miss Magazine, but when I moved to New York, I didn't realize that I live very close to Miss Magazine Way. Oh, There's yes. a street that's named after this magazine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's been such a pleasure. I'd like to say, Ms. Magazine still publishes. Um, they have a website that's publishing daily, but also four times a year we have a print magazine. And if anybody would like a free subscription, there's a QR code on these bookmarks. Thank you. <laughs>